Good evening, everybody. Hopefully this works this time. I just tried to go live and it wasn't working on me. We weren't getting any viewers. It looks like it was not discoverable. So I'm not exactly sure what's going on here. We're having uh, an issue here, I think, where stuff is not coming through. It looks like... <clears throat> Let's see. Is it working? There we go. I see ya. Hey, Karen. So it is working. I'm just not seeing any uh, any concurrent viewers on the stats. I started up uh, and there was nothing. <clears throat> so, all right, good. Molly, nice to see you. All right, so maybe the uh, maybe the stats are not working correctly, and I'm not seeing any uh, interaction. But I'm glad that we have people in the chat now, so at least know something's happening. So it has been uh, pretty busy around here. I took over a week and went down to Fort Lauderdale. My wife and I had our 19th wedding anniversary, and I went to my little sister's wedding, and we had a wonderful time. We just took a break. I did post a couple of videos from South Florida, which you may or may not have seen, depending on how interested you are in South Florida gardening. One of the weird things about this channel is that I have gardened over so many different climates over the years and in different places that I have picked up viewers from certain climates and then moved climates. And then the people in the climate that I was in go, wait a minute, <clears throat> what is he doing? Why did he go over there? And I'm not going to watch this guy anymore because it really doesn't relate to me anymore. So, so far, I have actually gardened in zones 8, in zone 7, 6 slash 7, actually. So, 6 slash 7, 8, 8a slash 9b. I have gardened in zone 9 slash 10 in Polk County, Florida. And I have gardened in Fort Lauderdale which is zone 10 slash 11. It's really a pretty solid 11 most of the time. And then I gardened right near the equator, which was totally different. And there I picked up a lot of viewers from the Caribbean and some viewers from Africa and Indonesia and the Philippines and other tropical climates, including Hawaii, who said, oh, finally, there's a channel that's really covering the tropical stuff. So we've kind of been all over the place. And every time I move around, I'm, I'm hopefully done moving around. I think I'm just going to stick here in zone 8B. I always say that. I'm just going to stay this time. This time I actually bought a place, so hopefully that works out. It's funny when you move to a new place and you rent for a while, and then you try, and then you start over and you buy a place, and then you start over, and then and then you leave, and you start over. You know how it goes. Um, it, we are the we're the wandering generation, I guess. But I'm I'm hoping to stick here. And the nice thing about here is it's very similar to where I gardened before, south of Gainesville, north of Ocala, which was zone eight slash nine. And so we got very similar weather to what we have here in terms of how cold it got, though we got about twenty inches less rain and we got significantly fewer tornadoes. So this is a uh, this is different but it's similar enough that a lot of what i was doing there for frost protection actually works when i wrote the book push the zone the good guy to growing tropical plants beyond the tropics i was a couple of zones north of the tropics because i was in um north florida and i grew up in south florida and had you know coconuts in the backyard we had, um, we had, you know, pineapples and mangoes. My grandpa and grandma had a mango tree. Also, incidentally, for some reason, we are set on members only chat. And I set it, I turned it off so everybody could participate. And then um, it's YouTube turned it back on again. It actually says when I edit this video that it's uh it's everybody and then when i see it here it says that actually it's not it says that there are no restrictions so who knows let me see i'm going to see if i can switch that let's see if we can switch it so everybody can see 
Maybe that'll help. <clears throat> Anyhow, thank you guys my, for putting up with me. It's been a little while since I've done a live stream, and uh, I was thinking, I don't have anything else to show you guys this week because I've been busy building a chicken coop, but I have been looking and seeing the you know, the ends of our, our kind of our results from frost protection through this last really, really nasty dip. And some of you guys have seen weather way, way, way colder than what we saw. So here, you know, um, we're not supposed to get temperatures, particularly at the end of December, we're not supposed to get temperatures down in the mid teens. It's actually pretty rare that it even hits the mid teens here, even in the very middle of winter, let alone right at the start. So here we are. And here we are getting whacked after getting 70 degree weather and even up into the 80s and it's humid and it feels great. It feels like spring in South Florida. And then suddenly, boom, this nasty Arctic blast thing comes on down. And we really, um, we really, it was colder than I thought. I'll tell you that. Normally, some of my frost protection tricks like pull stuff up on a porch or put it against a south facing wall those things usually get us through a zone's difference but this time i actually pulled my potted coffee plants and i have some mango seedlings and i have some tropical greens and i had some various tropical plants that i've picked up here and there because hope springs eternal even though i'm in zone eight I was thinking, oh, you know, I could probably push this and push that. And I brought them up onto our closed in porch. It actually has like PVC and glass windows here and there around it. And on that porch, after the second day of it being below freezing outside, some of the pots were freezing solid on top. I watered them all before I brought them in. So you got a little more thermal mass there. And the water was actually freezing in the pots. So I lost tropicals that I never thought I never thought that on that enclosed porch it would get that cold and our dining room which has windows all around it a lot of single pane glass it's old old house it hit 39 degrees in our dining room that's pretty cold. So, uh, man, I mean, we, we uh, got the old fireplace working and shut two rooms of the house up together and had all the kids, uh, except for some of the older ones who wanted to go, you know, pretend they were Eskimos and stay in their rooms um, in the 30-something degree <laughs> weather inside. Uh, we uh, we had little kids sleeping all over the floor with a bunch of blankets and we had a roaring fire going and you know we're drinking coffee and reading books and uh, and staying warm it was really fun it was really fun but it kind of let us know you know which things do we really need to fix okay uh, there's definitely air coming in underneath that door there's no little bit of weather ceiling underneath the door that led into the hall to our bathroom it kind of there's this little hall and you can go outside and we usually leave that door shut and locked, but uh, the cold was coming in underneath the door and you could just feel it pouring past your feet, like uh, making your toes freeze. So I took a towel and rolled it up and stuffed it right there along the door. I mean, it was something else. It was something else, it was really cold. And you know, I love the idea of gardening all the way through the fall and the winter. I like to do that. And usually you can do that. I overplanted all the pastures with uh, clover and winter rye and and rye, grain rye and oats and you put some brassicas out there. And even that, a lot of that froze down. It's starting to come back now that it's a little bit warmer. It's colder, it's going to be freezing tonight and tomorrow night, but not that freezing, not 16 degrees freezing, you know? So, whew, it was rough. It was rough. Sometimes you're, 
you know, that's the way it is with gardening where you think, oh, this will go right through. I had just planted kohlrabi out in the gardens and I had all these cabbage transplants that had gotten pretty big and were looking pretty good. And I had rows of radishes that were looking good and I just went, oh man, I'm gonna do my best to see how they go through. So let me tell you how they did. <laughs> um, I'm gonna be posting some more pictures on the blog now that we're really past that frost event and you can really see how badly some things were burned and how well other things lived. And one thing that really struck me was how well just throwing sheets over the plants in the garden worked. Now, I did this a lot in in North Florida and saw it working quite well. So, hey, nice to see you all. Hey, Tay Tay, Karen, Anastasis, B, Liberty Not Licensed. Man, I've seen all the people that I love here. Gardener Earth Guy, Joe, Fishes and Loaves Life, Doug and Stacy, nice to see you, Doug. But it's cold up there. <laughs> Yikes. So, you know, I thought, all right, throwing sheets over stuff, it's going to get cold, but maybe it won't be, you know, normally it's not that cold, right? So I throw sheets over things in North Florida, it gets down to 25 degrees, you pull the sheets off, everything looks pretty good. Would it work at 16 degrees? Well, I, I really, I wasn't that hopeful. That's a long time. And not only that, it stayed below freezing for 48 hours. It wasn't just one of those events where you could throw a sheet over it and the heat from the ground is still kind of coming up, you know, still kind of coming up and it's going to trap it and it's going to be fine. I thought that's, this is a long time for it to be cold. And surprisingly, single cotton sheets over the radishes, uh, triple rows of radishes. I had two triple rows of radishes that were looking really, really, really good. I mixed up every radish variety I could find, and I figured I'd let them all go to seed, and then I'd save seeds and see what kind of weird thing that we get. And uh, I covered them up, and believe it or not, well, I've got pictures, so you can believe it, um, because everything you see on the internet is true. Um, definitely not Photoshop pictures. So the areas that I covered with sheets stayed green. They wilted just a little bit. You know, radishes have some cold tolerance. They're cold tolerant down into maybe the upper 20s or so, but they actually stayed quite well. And the ones that were uncovered, roasted down to the ground, just melted, just melted them. And they're starting to come back a little bit with a little bit of green here and there, but I don't think they're ever going to really make great radishes. But the ones that were covered, you could actually see it. A line, the line of the edge of the sheet, beautiful green, and then just wilted blackened leaves right next to it. So through 16 degrees overnight and then like a 17 or 18 degree overnight with 48 hours below freezing, Thrift store sheets, $2.99, $3.99 for a king. They, they covered it. And they lived. I just ran out of sheets. So it actually ended up being very interesting because there's areas where they're just completely melted because I didn't have a sheet. And then right next to it, beautiful row of radishes looks perfectly fine. And we're still harvesting radishes and eating them with our scrambled eggs for breakfast. So, wow. That's cheap, right? Now, I have a friend, and she told me that the little uh, the little low tunnel things that she was doing for her garden were one of the best things that she ever added to her garden because it extended her growing season all the way through. And I looked at her system, and I thought, man, that's really cool. She's had little pieces of rebar in the ground with little bent PVC pipes and then a piece of uh, frost blanket you know, going over. So she had all these greens underneath these little rows. But, I mean... I, first of all, I don't really like plastic. And I don't really like buying stuff all that much. I mean, I don't like buying stuff that costs much. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you could do this. You could do this. I might do this at some point. 
But for me, like buying thrift store sheets that afternoon and throwing them over the top of it, that's kind of more my style. Like, let's see if they live. That's probably good enough. I don't have to hammer anything into the ground and drag things around. And, and I don't have these rows of plastic in my garden. It just looks cool, you know. I, you know, it, it, it's all sciencey and stuff, but I don't really want that. I want it to kind of look, I want my gardening to look developing world style. You know, like we're all going to be living in a few years when uh, the last flush toilet gives out. You know, we're going to be out there with our, with our grub hoe hacking holes in the ground, you know. Um, thank you very much for the uh, super chat. Karen says, woohoo for a good stream. Thank you, I really appreciate it. And Blue Resident Monkey, well, that's very um, generous of you too. Thank you for that. Wow, I really appreciate it. Um, so there's something magical. There's something magical about doing something that's really simple and having it work. This is why I kind of have gotten obsessed with the old row garden, victory garden thing. I have in the past had barrels. I had a friend that gave, made me a barrel garden once and he had made one for himself and he made one for me and it had all these little holes in it and it had this center piece of PVC and the worms lived in it and you could stuff down compost in the inside and the worms would carry it through and you get all these little these pockets on the outside. Really good for growing little lettuces and strawberries and things like that. And I had that for a while and it was kind of cool. But, you know, I had a big blue barrel in my garden. Um, if they made barrels out of bamboo, you know, it would look cooler. But, um, you know, I did that for a bit and then I had, I did the square foot garden thing for a while because my wife wanted to try it. I said, why not? Well, just experiment with it. It works pretty well. You know, it really does. Um, you make that perfect Mel's mix and, and do that stuff. And, uh, you know, you've got to go out and buy this and buy this and buy this and get your lumber and do the, do the edges and do all that cool stuff. And it works. It works. And I have, I actually, you know, you're not going to believe this, but 10 years ago, I was looking into doing some aquaponics in my backyard and I got as far as getting some tanks and then I just grew a bunch of mucky swamp plants in them and some fish and I didn't put the pumps up and everything. I just couldn't bring myself to put all that infrastructure together. And then we lived for four years in the, you know, I guess you could call it the developing world where PVC was expensive, where everything imported was expensive, where you couldn't even get wood chips, where buying potting soil was prohibitive, where you couldn't go and buy vermiculite, where trying to get, you know, fingerling tilapia for your system was really difficult if you wanted to do that sort of thing. And I really re-simplified and stripped down. I thought I was pretty stripped down before but when it's really hard to buy things and it's basically human powered, I, I just, I was just amazed by how much food some of these guys would grow. There were these Rastafarians on the side of the mountain and they would go up there with a grub hoe and some seeds or some pieces of yams or whatever else. And they would go up there and they would chop into the ground and they would use a machete to clear the grass and they would hack holes in the ground and make these mounded beds and they grew so much food. And meanwhile, they had this pilot program they were doing with aquaponics, which took up way too many resources and way too much effort. And I was looking at all these little anemic lettuces and things in their demonstration garden and going, wow. There's hardly any food in here compared to how much food these guys are hauling off the side of the mountain. They're growing with the rainfall. They are, there was this one friend of mine named Mike. <clears throat> He's a great guy, very clever gardener. Does not own a car. Doesn't know how to drive. Lived on the same mountain his entire life. And he was a fantastic farmer. And I just said, Mike, teach me how to do this. Teach me what you're doing. Teach me this simple stuff. It's so cool. It's so cool. Just these perfect, beautiful yams that he got and these beautiful cabbages and all this stuff. And it was all, yeah, like like uh, Doug said, dirt, seed, and water and the sweat of our brow. Really, really simple. And so when it came to the frost protection thing, 
I have had a greenhouse in the past. I've thought about getting another greenhouse. I don't want to pull the trigger. I've looked at the complete cost of setting up a proper greenhouse. Uh, maybe four or five thousand dollars in weekends worth of work to get it going, and then I gotta get a bunch of barrels to keep it, you know, the thermal mass in there to keep it warm, or put a heater in it, and I'm going. I don't really want to do it. You know, really the easiest thing to do is to grow with the climate and plant things and and not try to push them. But sometimes you really want to push stuff. You really want to push stuff. So, you know, something like a uh, satsuma tree. Let's say a satsuma tree. Satsumas can take temperatures down into the teens. They'll see some damage. You'll lose some fruit sometimes. But they can take it. It's a very cold hardy as citrus go. But for the first few years, they can't take it. So if you put all your effort into the first few years, after that you can have incredible vitamin C explosive flavored satsumas coming out of your yard in abundance. You know, the people sell them by the buckets uh, in season by the side of the road. But you gotta, you gotta push it. Now, I, I don't really, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with reaching for the sky. Like if you wanted to do a tropical food forest inside of a greenhouse and grow all the cool stuff that you can only dream of. If you have the, the resources for it and you love it and you want to do it, that's fantastic. Do it. I have done a lot of things that don't make sense. Like tonight, uh, I have one of my sons is in charge of making sure that all my potted coffee plants come onto the porch overnight while it's freezing. And I, I pay him <laughs> by the hour to haul coffee pots in and out. Does it make sense? Not really. Not really. I've got about 40 coffee plants in pots. It's ridiculous. I know it's ridiculous. I just love the idea of growing coffee. So I can bring them onto the porch. And if it gets really cold, we brought them into the hallway of our house. So the house was like, you know, a Kona coffee farm through the frost. It was just all full of it. And um, and we had we I had to drag my citruses in pots off of the front porch and put them into the center of the house and they're all blooming. It was it was amazing. It smelled like a citrus grove inside of the house. But you know, there's a lot of dirt that goes along with that, and it's a lot of labor. It doesn't really make sense for survival or growing food, not necessarily. Yeah, D Doug says there are off-grid people that tried aquaponics. I told them over and over. It took five years, and they finally admitted it and gave up. Yeah, it's it just there's there's this ideal that we have in our minds sometimes where where this thing if it works it would be really amazing. But sometimes just going back to the old simple things that's the way to go. Uh, there is a book called Anti Fragile by uh, Nazim Taleb. I love Nazim Taleb's working uh, works. Uh, he wrote Black Swan. Um, and he wrote Anti-Fragile, he wrote, um, what was the other one? Skin in the Game. Skin in the Game was really good too. Um, but he's written about five books or so. But he mentions that things that have persisted for a long period of time are likely to persist longer into the future than something that has just arrived. There is a track record to a religion or a philosophy or an idea or a book or a building, if it's lasted a certain amount of time, if it's managed to withstand time for a long, a long period, it's probably going to keep going, right? So Tom Sawyer has been a classic for a long time. It's going to continue to be a classic. I read um, Tom Jones, a fantastic novel. Hilarious. I believe it's from the 1700s. And it's so good. Might have been early 1800s. I have to double check. It was so good. It, there's a reason that it's a classic. Because it was so good. And it continues. The King James Bible is probably going to outlast the, the modern good thoughts Bible for women with with daily challenge devotionals in it, right? 
there's like, it's a classic, and it sounds cool. The Dewey Reims translation that the Catholics often use, that has the complete apocrypha and everything in it, that's going to keep lasting. There are, there are modern things that just show up and you're like, oh, that's so cool. I saw that on Pinterest. I'm going to try that. And then, you know, you look at it and you try it and it may work. And it's really kind of fun. Like I've seen all these stacked garden things. Get a whole bunch of five-gallon buckets and put them in rows and stack them. And, and they've got little self-watering, wicking things and stuff. But really, is that going to continue I don't know. I don't, I don't think that's going to be a classic method 500 years from now, but row gardening will still exist. So the simplicity of of some methods and practices and their, their the way they stick makes sense. We have this idea like row gardening. I've talked about this before. I'm just it's just one of my favorite things. Row gardening, you know, you put these you got these wide rows. Why do they have wide rows? Because you have to get a tractor through them. Well, that's not the entire reason there's wide rows. Yes, a tractor can get through them and they may space them according to tractor tires, but there's a certain amount of spacing that allows you to take advantage of rainfall because there is more of a bank of water in the soil available to the plants. It takes less nutrition in the soil to grow crops and it takes less water because they're widely spaced. So if you knock the weeds down in between them and keep them pretty clean, they're not fighting for the limited amount of water that's in the soil and therefore you don't have to haul a hose over an acre of corn or put irrigation out there these methods were developed in a time where these things were scarce and if they're scarce again you're going to want to use that method rather than a highly intense method that requires you buying a bunch of compost or buying specific amendments and doing everything really perfectly or having this plastic thing and this rain bird and this and that and the other thing so when it comes to frost protection, I like to keep it kind of simple too. First of all, I try to grow stuff with the climate if I think I'm going to survive on it. I don't think I'm going to survive on that coffee. I have a miracle fruit tree in a pot. I have mango seedlings in pots. Am I going to survive on them? No. Not unless I had money to build one of those awesome Victorian greenhouses where I could just keep it all there, like the grand old Opryland in, uh, in Nashville where they've got this towering, incredible space with all of this, you know, all this glass greenhouse work where they've got entire palm trees growing inside and boats going around them and stuff. The amount of maintenance and everything on that is absolutely incredible. I don't understand why they don't grow jackfruit in there instead of growing a bunch of ornamentals. They should be growing jackfruit and coconuts and stuff like that, but they're, they're kind of wasting the space. It's, it's all conceit. It's all vanity. It's beautiful and it's amazing to take your family there, but it's uh, it's conceit. Like you could probably feed half of Nashville if you decided you were gonna grow tropical fruits in there, but that's not the point of it. The point of it is for businessmen to spend lots of money at the, uh, the steakhouse there and do conventions where they talk about new advances in marketing and that sort of thing. So <laughs> I've been to a couple of conventions there at the Opryland back when I was you know in the business, man. I was a nobody. I was a nobody, but I went to those things to try and, you know, try and get freelance audio editing work. So, try to grow with the climate first of all. So, that may that might mean growing with the seasons. Sometimes it doesn't really make sense to try and maintain a garden all the way through the winter like we're trying to do this year. Most years it would work for us because it's only getting down to the upper 20s and we don't have to do a lot of frost protection or care. You know, most of the time your your collards and cabbages and you know your radishes and daikons and all that kind of stuff they're going to go right through if they're they're somewhat cold tolerant already so you can often get them in in the fall and then be harvesting nice green leaves and little baby carrots and stuff like that through the winter and then in the spring they really take off and they give you a good harvest and then you start your spring garden at the same time but it's not really reasonable to expect that that's going to work every year and the further north you get the less likely it is. You're better off growing stuff during the summer that you can store and eat through the winter in reasonable methods like, you know, uh, putting it into your pantry or, or drying and curing or canning 
or having a root cellar where you can store things through. There are old varieties of apples that'll store right through the winter and into the spring so you could still be eating good apples, like the apple variety stamen wine sap. They, the, the outside of it gets a little wrinkly, but it's got a good hard skin on it and it doesn't rot easily. It's not like a lot of your fresh eating apples that rot quickly. We're used to these dessert apples that don't really keep very well. There are varieties that keep. If you concentrate on the stuff that actually works in your climate and will keep through the winter, that's the first thing. Grow what actually wants to grow in the winter. And if you can't, if you can't pull off stuff in the winter, have a really awesome spring through fall and then store up what you can. And maybe you, you know, are eating animal products through the winter. The further north you get, the more people tend to rely on animal products animals because of a shorter growing season you get down to the equatorial tropics and you could just live on bananas it doesn't matter but the further north you get the harder it is to get enough sunshine captured and enough stored up from the ground to get you all the way through so you you tend to rely on things like small grains and then you have you know you go hunt whales or something like that demonetized so the first thing is that and then the second thing is you know what is the simplest way I can I can do something and and it's kind of tried and true and just throwing sheets over plants that's pretty easy and the other thing that we do is we mound up leaves if you have straw or pine needles or leaves they're all falling in the fall so you might as well gather a bunch of them up I mounded in the garden with the help of some of my kids a bunch of leaves we just gathered lots and lots of fall leaves. There's tons and tons of fall leaves. So we took bags and bags and bags of leaves, and then we mounded them over the top of all of the cabbages and the broccoli. And that keeps the cold from coming through. It acts like a blanket. And of course, you've got all this trapped air inside of there too, which is a excellent insulator. So you've got this fluff of leaves over the top and the ground beneath does not freeze and it stays warm enough underneath there and it keeps the frost from coming down. And you get this great simple mulch, this great simple frost protection, absolutely free just for some labor. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool and that's pretty simple. So that's, uh, that's one thing to consider, you know, sheets, and leaves and the other thing to think about when you're thinking about getting your garden through the cold is if there is a plant that you really really wish that you could grow but it grows just a little too far south for you to manage it it doesn't mean that it's impossible to grow where you are there may be a microclimate in your yard that will allow you to grow that plant so somebody asked me about star fruit. Can I grow star fruit in zone 8A? Well, that's a push. Star fruit don't like temperatures below freezing. If it dips down to about 28 degrees or so, it's going to see damage. And if it stays at 28 degrees for a day or so, it'll probably kill the tree. That's pretty rough. That's pretty rough. Um, it It's just you're pretty much limited to zone 10 and 11 for star fruit except except if you have a perfect microclimate a friend of mine had a box of avocados at his place and he said do you want some avocados and i looked at these avocados i said wow these are big these are tropical avocados he says yep i said where'd you get them and he said, a friend of mine grows them right here in the Ocala area. And I said, whoa, Ocala area. Okay, now I've got tropical avocados. I started tropical avocados from seed. And I planted them here and there in my food forest to see if possibly some of them might live. I planted them in the shade and I covered some of them a little bit. And I tried to find little pockets where they might grow. And they invariably would freeze down and then grow back and then freeze down and then grow back. Hmm. How is your friend growing these? Now, there are cold, hardy varieties of avocado. I knew that. But these were not those. So how is your friend growing these? Well, she has them between her swimming pool and her house on the side of a hill that faces south. Whoa. Okay, south-facing, so it's not getting the cold north wind. 
it's collecting solar energy during the day. It's got that warmth of the sun going around and getting that round warmer through the day and then that releases slowly overnight. But not only that, a swimming pool is a body of water. And it takes a lot of energy to freeze a big body of water. And in the in the cold snaps that you get in Ocala, which may go down into the 20s, I even counted a 12 degree night once, but it only touched 12 degrees for an hour or two. By the next morning, mid-morning, the sun had come out and it was back up to about 40 degrees. It rarely stayed below freezing for any period of time. It's br brief, brutal, overnight frost events, and then it's warm again, relatively. So that body of water takes a lot of energy to get that thing below freezing. So that is warm, moist air coming off the top of that and just radiating warmth. And now there's also a house so the house is getting the sunshine on it. And that is also blocking that cold. So you've got this slope, some trees, a swimming pool, and a house. It's boxed in and warmed by the sun coming down and catching that little pocket. And it was enough that the frost did not settle and destroy the blooms or the fruit. Whoa! really cool it worked now back to star fruit star fruit my friend Curtis lives just a little bit south of Ocala still not star fruit territory it still freezes pretty good there it's right in the middle of the state it's on a ridge he found a spot alongside a garage where he had his office and there was a garage and an office making an angle like this with an overhang. And he planted the tree underneath the overhang. So it got sunshine, but if the cold came down overnight, it came down on the overhang and it flowed mostly past that tree. All along that wall were starfruit, bearing right there in a zone where starfruit do not grow. It was about a zone too cold to grow star fruit without losing the tree every three years or so. And it was doing just fine. Oh, well, that's so cool. It's a little pocket. So sometimes you have these places on your property that may actually be capable of maintaining something that you wouldn't think you could necessarily grow there. Uh, one method for doing that is to espalier trees right to a wall. So you're bending the branches back, growing them in a fan shape. The French were really, really good at this. They would grow peach trees inside of Paris against all of these walls that would protect the blooms and the fruit from frost and provide fresh peaches to the Parisian markets back in the 1800s. That's really neat. Did you know that? So they're a little too far north to grow peaches generally out in the open. So they were growing these nice beautiful peach fruit undamaged by the cold you know the tree may live but often they would lose the blooms if you left it out in the open so it protected it by fanning them out against walls that faced south and trapped the warmth overnight creating thermal mass it's still a simple solution we often have walls on our property we may have a south facing wall on our house i had a south facing wall on my house in north florida where i would grow a key lime tree. A friend of mine had a key lime tree out in his yard and he lived 45 minutes south of me and his tree froze to the ground repeatedly and never bore fruit. It would freeze to the ground over and over again. Every year or two it would just about recover and it would freeze down again. But I tied one back to my wall, planted it six inches from the, the concrete block wall facing south and that tree always gave us key limes and it did not freeze. If a branch went more than about two feet away from the wall, the end of it would freeze off. I planted black pepper and coffee along that wall. And as of after a year or two of, of after doing that, they had not died yet. I don't know what their current state is because I sold the house. But it was very interesting. I called it my Miami garden because it was basically zone 10 in a almost zone eight. 
So it's about a zone and a half warmer. I had about two feet out from the wall where I could grow tropical things. And what I did too was I grew a lot of tropical vegetables like longevity spinach and Okinawa spinach, Suriname purslane, Malabar spinach. And that area there, because it didn't freeze, I could take cuttings off of them in the spring and plant them out in my garden and reap them all through the rest of the year. And then those ones out in the garden would freeze down, but I would have mother plants that I could just break cuttings off of and start them again later on. Oh, so cool. So cool. And it was really, really simple. I didn't have to build a greenhouse. I did put a greenhouse up later. I really, really wanted one. I bought a cheap greenhouse. I put some barrels in it. I kept some stuff alive in there. When I had my plant nursery, it made more sense because I could keep plants alive through the winter there and start seedlings and get them ready for market earlier. Like I said, it's not wrong. And I had a, a good monetary reason to do that. I had a fruiting coffee tree inside of my greenhouse and I would save all the seeds off of it and take all the beans out. And then I would put I would start flats of little coffee seedlings on a heat mat and warm them up enough so they thought they were in the tropics again. And I could sell all of those little potted trees to other crazy gardeners that wanted to try growing coffee. And it was it was profitable. I think I paid $40 for the original tree and then grew it up to the point where it started fruiting. And then I would easily make a few hundred dollars a year in selling seedlings that started because of that greenhouse. The greenhouse would pay for itself just based on that coffee tree after a couple of years. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So I this is a lot of stuff that I cover in the book. Um, I wrote the book, Push the Zone. Um, and it's basically, it, it's not necessarily going to get you to be able to grow coffee in Minnesota. But what it will do is allow you to grab an extra zone's worth of growth. And sometimes that can be a lot. You can be really marginal for something right on the edge and you can grab it, grab stuff from the zone lower and grow it pretty simply. It's a book for for plant geeks, really. It's not my best selling book. It's it's people that buy it really like it. They enjoy it because it's it's out there, but it's for crazy people. It's not a survival gardening book so much as it is a plant geek book. You know, um, you're probably not going to be able to hugely impact your food supply that way, though some of the methods will help you with some of it. It's just a, if you're interested in it, you might enjoy that book sort of a book. It's not a, you got to get this book because it'll save your life. You know, um, sign up for my seminar, you know, whatever. It's not like that. It's just, I, I was so excited about some of the, the playing around that we were able to do that uh, I had to write a book on it. So, <laughs> Carolyn says, I like the book, but I'm crazy. <laughs> hey, Dan S., nice to see you. So, yeah, I uh, I think when you when you're in your garden, if you're if you're focusing on survival and focusing on food, it makes the most sense. It really makes the most sense to grow with your climate and to use the really simple stuff first. There are a lot of people that will try to sell you a difficult, complicated, expensive solution. That's, I mean, that's what we do, right? Um. We always want a more convenient, more perfect type of a thing. And people try to get me um, regularly, marketers write me and try to get me to sell systems. Like, do, do, would you be an associate for our smart watering system? Nah, I don't want to do that. You know, would you consider our such and such with a camera that will track this and that? And nah, I'm not really interested in that. Would you, would you help us sell our super fruit tree starter plastic thing. No, nah, not really interested in that. I'm more interested in in, you know, everybody being able to grow their own food and 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 not be gimmicky about it. Just the dirt, some seeds, you know, it gets cold, throw some leaves over your plants. You know, get some thrift store sheets. There's my there's my concession to uh conspicuous consumerism. Go out and spend $30 on thrift store sheets and you can cover a huge garden with it. 
That's it. That's that's about that's about it. I'm so cheap. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm gonna answer some questions. That's all I wanted to say. Try to do try to do simple stuff. Um, all right, let me let me see here. I'm gonna answer some questions. This is that time of year where I'm like, what gardening am I gonna do right now? It's so cold. I've been building a chicken coop. That's what I've been doing. I mean, because the price of eggs has actually made it worthwhile to build a bigger coop. Beat me up, Mr. Scott says, I'm going to attempt to germinate my homestead Aquarius peaches next week. Look out for a video soon. Well, good luck. I hope that works out really well and that you do a, a cool video on it. Um, it's fun growing peaches from seed. Molly says, Ice Age Farmer posted on Telegram on November 8th. Oh, he did post something. Okay. I hadn't seen anything from him for months and months, and people have been writing me and saying, have you heard from him? Have you heard from him? And I, I haven't. I actually wrote him a couple times and hadn't heard anything, so I'm glad that that he's somewhere. I hope he's okay. Um, let's see. Laura, thank you for the super chat. Much appreciated. I see that hand. Koi, thank you for the super chat. Uh, Carolyn is happy to have me back doing live streams. Thank you for that super chat, Carolyn. I uh, I just have been busy, and I have been reading to the kids in the evening, and I've been trying to get most of my work done in the morning, get some writing done, get a post up on the blog, um, you know, answer answer emails, answer comments, and work on getting a video up, and then by the middle of the afternoon, I'm trying to do farming stuff. And trying to, you know, either working on chicken coop or cleaning things up or there's a lot of bits and pieces that happen when you move. There's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be improved and done. And then I'm also trying to spend more time with the, the children because I realized I could just totally be a workaholic and just work, 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 work. I like to write and I like to uh, I like to interact with people and teach and all that. But I I, I thought, you know, my kids are going to get older. My oldest is 18 now they're gonna start moving out of the house before too long i may be missing the best years of my life right now so i didn't want to work so so much so i've been trying to really slam it in the morning and get stuff done and then sometimes i go out with the kids there's a there's a little park with some baseball diamonds so we've gone out and played baseball and um you know we were playing kickball the other day sometimes we just you know go visit and I, I've been trying to spend a little more time, get up real, you know, pretty early and get stuff done in the morning and then have a little bit of time while it's still sunny out to go play. It's supposed to be good for you. You know, to go play. <laughs> Citrus does not need cold stratification. Yes, that's right. Citrus seeds need to be fresh. Beam me up, Mr. Scott says. Yes, uh, plant them, you know, get take them out of the fruit and plant them stick them in the ground like a half an inch deep water them occasionally don't overwater them they usually come up in about a month if it's um if it's moderately warm i have been taking the seeds out of various citrus and sticking them into my potted citrus i have these big pots with little citrus trees on them that i've been putting on my porch so i'm sticking the seeds into the ground and the little seedlings are coming up around the big trees. So here's a, you know, there's a kumquat and a grapefruit and a lemon and whatever. I don't even pay any attention to what they are. What I'm doing is letting them get bigger and then I'm just going to plant them out in my yard and whichever ones live, live. Molly says, have you ever tried grafting mango onto Brazilian pepper trees? I want to give it a try. I have a few Central Florida source for science. No, I don't have a favorite Central Florida source, but anywhere you can find somebody with a mango, you could ask them. I I doubt that it would work. I know that the Brazilian pepper trees are in the same family, but that's pretty far. I have tried some cross-genus grafting before without luck. Sometimes weird things work. Like I've heard that you can graft loquat onto pyracantha. I haven't tried it. I'd like to try it. And I, I grafted uh, peaches onto Chickasaw Plum, and I grafted European plums onto Chickasaw Plum, which worked really well. I tried grafting sweet cherry onto black cherry. That did not take. I have grafted apples onto apples and pears onto pears and that sort of thing. And various citrus will intergraft with each other. You can graft pecans and hickory together. 
the further out you get, the less likely it is that the graft is going to take well. I think it's worth trying. I grafted pears onto Hawthorne and actually had the grafts take, which I thought was really neat. Um, I tried grafting figs and mulberries together with no luck. I also tried grafting mulberries onto paper mulberry because paper mulberry is all over the Ocala area and it's really invasive. So a friend of mine had one in her yard, so I took a bunch of different mulberry scions and I chopped the whole top of this uh, paper mulberry back and I grafted all over it and none of them took. I was very disappointed because I thought that was a really cool idea and it didn't happen. I'm so sad. Too Many Cooks sends a super chat. Thank you very much. It says, Sugar Pie is such great music. Live music, live stream when? I should really do one again. I really should. It would be cool. I have not done anything with music lately. I really have. I don't know what I've been doing with my life, guys. Really don't know. I've actually been spending a lot of time cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> After moving, we had all these boxes and boxes of books. I was searching through boxes of books, getting through books that we giving away, books we don't need, giving away bits of furniture we don't need, just getting junk out. There was a lot of junk left uh, at the properties. There was some really nice stuff left at the property, but there was some serious junk left too. And so I've taken, I think, two loads of metal scrap junk um, to the recycling facility and got a few bucks for it. And and there's just there's like outbuildings that have a lot of stuff in them like termite eaten wood and old broken tools and um like bags and bags of old christmas decorations and stuff like that so i'm trying to take different spaces when i have gaps and to get me out of the office and doing something i'll go and organize and, and clean something so we'll get a couple of kids and we'll work on that like this weekend's goal is to get rid of 200 things and I think we'll be able to do it some weird stuff happened when you move you know I, I I kept saying where are all the seasonings I thought that we had garlic powder where did our garlic powder go I guess we better go buy some more I thought that we had parsley leaves I thought that we had this couldn't find them so we bought spices here and there and I thought maybe we just run out and then I found a box of spices in the bottom of a closet when I was looking for um, the rest of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire because I read the first half of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire the first what did I read the first four volumes or five volumes this last year and there's three more volumes and I just it was driving me nuts because I wanted to read through the entire series I got to read it you know while I'm still remembering where we are um, Heraclius just beat back the Persian king and, and, and from Byz Byzantium and then the first city has fallen to the Muslims. So I was like, I want to read more, but I have no idea where those books went. So I was digging through the closet and I went through about 30 boxes. And then I found a box of spices. <laughs> so, oh boy. Um... Yeah, you just, you know, when you move, there's really a lot that happens. And I, I think that, that threw us off a lot. We only moved back in August. And I'm still kind of dealing with it. I'm trying to stay full tilt on making sure that I've got my blog up and gardens in and the chickens cared for and the cows cared for. We took one of the cows out to be bred, you know. Uh, so she should be back. Rachel's milking the cows twice a day she's only milking one cow right now because the other one's over at a friend's house being bred but she should be coming back this next week yeah she's a lot of stuff going on so uh fishes and loves life said are you seeing the parallels to babylon in america reading that series you know there are some parallels between the ancient roman empire and america but the roman empire was actually much healthier much much healthier and more cohesive with a stronger national history, I think. And it lasted much, much longer. If you think about how long the Roman Empire actually lasted, you know, um, Byzantium, let's see, Constantinople did not fall until I believe it was uh, 14. Let's see, was it 1453? I think it was in May. 
one second. Let me double check. Yes, there we go. The city was captured on 29th May, 1453. So that's a very, very long time for a culture to continue even though that was, you know, it was evolving and changing over the years and the people were changing, but that was a long time. Long, long time. And I don't, I don't think that, uh, I don't think that this particular experiment is going to last near that long. Michelle says, you move back to Florida? Uh, no, I actually, I live north of the Florida Panhandle. I'm about an hour from Pensacola, outside of Bruton. Beam me up, Mr. Scott says, David, got to say you look healthy. Well, I appreciate it. I have been concentrating on eating a nutrient-dense diet. I have a lot. I drink, um, I try to eat things as natural as possible. Uh, I drink black coffee, you know, and I, I eat a lot of eggs out of the, out of the, from our own chickens, you know, and, and uh, I eat our own vegetables and... I live a very moderate lifestyle and I work out regularly and I'm trying to take good care of myself. My wife does too. And I, I um, it makes a big difference. I think diet is actually the primary thing. Not that we couldn't be struck by something else, but a lot of our, a lot of our health problems are diet. And I really do feel good and have plenty of energy to do what I want to do. And there were been times in my past when I did not eat particularly well. I used to go eat Wendy's for lunch and I used to drink soda, and I, I don't do any of that anymore. I just totally don't. Um, Wendy says, I moved to my permanent home 10 years ago, and I still haven't finished going through boxes. It's a process, not one I particularly enjoy. Yeah, you know, and your stuff weighs on you. You always have... They, I'm always getting rid of stuff, and then I get more stuff, because it's like, what a great deal. I'll probably use that. And then after a year or so, I'm like, I didn't use that. That's going to the thrift store. You know, A Woman Rides the Beast. I think that was by Dave Hunt, wasn't it, Molly? I believe I read that book. LF Ward says, uh, or IF Ward says, Do you use one of those U shaped grafting knives? And for zone 8A, approximately when would you graft? Uh, good question. You know, my favorite grafting. So I got a train going by. My favorite grafting knife is just a utility blade. That's what I use for almost all of my grafting. I do have a proper grafting knife with the little notch where you can do the bud, you know, the bud notcher and kind of pry it open and whatever. I do almost everything with a cheap, like a $5 Ace Hardware utility razor knife. I love it. It, it cuts really nicely. I can just change the blade when it's not doing well. And um, I get great grafts on it. And I did, when I was learning to graft, I cut a bunch of wood uh, I just cut a bunch of sticks, dormant sticks, from a tree that needed pruning. And then I cut them apart at my table and grafted them together at my table. Cut them apart and grafted them together. Cut them apart and stuck them together until I practiced the different cuts and I got them to lock together nicely. And then I went out and I did actual trees. So, um, no, I just use a regular utility knife. For zone 8A, I would probably graft uh, at the end of February, beginning of March. Carl says, roughly 700 B.C. to 1453 A.D. Not too shabby. Yeah, not at all. The biggest difference between Rome and America, Rome had better roads. Uh, yeah, Rome had pretty imp impressive roads and fantastic bridges. Though I was driving through Florida uh, this last week, and Florida has really nice roads. I mean, I had to drive up to, I uh, drove up and met Doug and Stacy in Missouri, and when we drove through Illinois, Illinois was horrible. The roads had all kinds of potholes in them. The There was one road that we went down where all of the stripes on the road were uneven, like somebody was dragging a paintbrush behind the truck when they painted it. And I said, I never saw anything like that in Florida. Florida has really nice roads almost everywhere. But I don't know. Florida, the new Rome. I'll write that book. Ultimate Gardening said, I had to move all my orchids inside because I'm not leaving them outside. Yeah, you can't trust your orchids to the cold. It might get below 50 there down in South Florida. Woo! -hoo. 
Koi, you can write me. Um, I don't know that I need a tractor, but that's nice of you. Um, but you can write me anytime. That's my email. I just dropped it in the chat. Thank you for the offer. I'm kind of... I mean, I like I like tractors. They're cool. But I've been back to... Back to... Um, Back to hand tools mostly. I do. I did get a tiller to break up the grass in new areas, but from then on, most of it is tended with tools. J Wolf says I'd like to see a video on spraying fruit trees. I don't really spray them usually. Um, very, very rarely. Fishes Loves Life says, uh, mine is low carb too, but all nutrient dense, anti inflammatory, not as many fats, but still love the healthy fats to absorb the nutrients out of veggies. Yeah, I eat, um, I eat a lot of tallow. We're actually going to be rendering some more tallow, um, from, you know, that's just cow fat, beef fat. And, uh, we use, we use lard, like real lard. Uh, I would love to raise a lard pig just so we could get tons and tons of cooking lard. And we have a lot of butter because uh, of the cows. My wife makes butter. We get like a big ball of butter every time she does it. It's really cool. <laughs> Free American 2020 says climate change defeated the Roman Empire. Spoiler! Let's see. Dan says, how is the secret pathway uncovering? It's going well. I got to the end of the, the buried sidewalk. I'm using it for a garden path now. White Feather says, can I push the zone for a Meyer lemon, zone 8, by planting by a pond? Possibly. It's possible. It, it helps if there's a little bit of overhang over the top of it. Like, if you've got a pond, plus you have some shade over the top of the tree, particularly evergreen shade. If it's a little bit under the shade... It'll help a lot. You can you could probably push it in that case. Um, just not having the sky looking down at your tree, as crazy as that sounds, anything that's under an overhang does not see the frost damage of something outside of it. I actually noticed this intensely. There is a couple of magnolia trees in the yard, and there was green grass underneath the magnolias, and the grass outside of it was brown. Very interesting. Let's see. Oh, the other thing is with your Meyer lemon, you're going to have to protect it the first couple of years, no matter what. Just, just you know, let it get big. Once it's big, don't prune it or anything. Let it make as big a round ball shape as it can as it can make, and it'll do better. Yes, there are lard pigs. Our modern varieties of pigs are often been bred for a lot of lean meat, lean muscle meat. Uh, many of the older variety of pigs were more valuable for their cooking fat. Uh, lard was used for a lot and you could get a lot of lard out of a pig so you could take your kitchen scraps and convert it to cooking oil pretty cool carl says real lard is a secret to lots of cuban central american cooking everyone's grandma used to have a can of bacon grease on the stove back in the day too yeah my wife saves the bacon grease and cooks with it there you go, Mangalitsa, lard, lard pigs. I've seen those. They look so weird. Uh, Let's Grow Texas says, I live in 9B and my citrus may have just barely survived that last freeze. So long as the, uh, the trunks don't crack uh, through the bark, usually they'll live and they'll grow back. But I've had orange trees where the bark actually split out from a freeze and it just died. That was it. Laura says, I have a lot of tropical trees in pots and brought them in the last time it got cold. Is that really necessary? Jackfruit, starfruit, avocado, etc. Um, some of them can be damaged below 40 degrees. Some of them are really touchy. But generally, if it's going to touch 32 or if it's going to get within a few degrees of 32 and it's a tropical tree, they don't have the ability to protect themselves. Yes, you should bring them in. Yeah, Meyer are somewhat cold hardy. They're more cold hardy than the Eureka lemons for certain. Pig juice. That's bacon grease in Scott's house. That's nice. That's that's gross. <laughs> I'm probably going to get a couple of pigs. Um, 
I have a friend who has some, and uh, he's got piglets. I just, I'm trying to finish up getting the chickens set up the way I like them, and I'm getting some more chickens, so it'll be good. Anyhow, I'm going to let you go. Um, I have to uh, go inside and eat dinner, but it's been an hour. Thank you all for joining me. I hope it was somewhat useful on you know getting plants through the cold or at least thinking about how to do things as simple as possible. We planted an apple orchard. I should probably do a video where we actually have good audio for it. I was live streaming it and we were testing out Rachel's new phone to see if we could live stream on it and the audio was not good unless I was right next to the phone so we're gonna have to fix that issue. But I'll do a video probably on that. I need to go plant. I actually have like six more apples I need to plant that are healed in right now and, and just waiting for me to put them out in the yard. That'll be another experiment with gardening in the south. So um, y'all have a great evening, a wonderful weekend. And if you're interested in the Push the Zone book, um, you can you can support a large family living in poverty-stricken Alabama. So, <laughs> God bless you all. Have a good evening. And, uh, you know, check the blog. If you don't see me on YouTube, remember, thesurvivalgardener.com. The sur I'm going to write it down. Thesurvivalgardener.com. I post almost every day. And it's nice to uh, interact with people over there in the comments. I absolutely love writing and it takes less effort for me than filming videos it's just i i write so quickly and really really enjoy it so um i like the interaction over there and if i have an interesting idea i put it on the blog and play with it and when people send me emails and garden pictures i often post them over there too i'm not really on social media per se uh so my blog is it but we can interact over there and comment back and forth so i'll see you guys there god bless you all um, thank you very much, Liberty Not Licensed. Good to see you again. Thank you very much for the super chat. And for all of you for turn it, tuning in, I'll try to do some more of these pretty soon. God bless. Catch you next time.